It's, it's my first time in Chennai, it's my first time in India. Just arrived yesterday, so it's very exciting for me. So I, I hope I will learn a lot about this city and this country and so everything that happens here. And I will tell you a little bit about some uh, quantum groups. So I will give some introduction to compact quantum groups. And then, uh, so in the first week, I will, I will try to tell you a little bit about some basics. And in the second week, I will speed up maybe a little bit and then pass to the so-called easy quantum groups. So this is the subject which I'm uh, studying. This is some combinatorial quantum groups. So I will give you a short outline of, of these three weeks. But uh, whenever there are questions, please interrupt me whenever I'm too slow, too fast, or maybe a bit unclear. Just always interrupt me. So this is not meant that I'm telling you something and you're just listening. So, listening, so if there's anything, just tell me. OK. So. Introduction to to easy quantum groups. So, in the as I said, in the the first week, we will more focus on the general uh, theory about quantum groups, and then we will pass to these easy quantum groups, which are certain subclass, and they are meant to be easy to understand. So, let's see if this is true or not. OK, so the table of contents. So we will start with some introduction. Motivation. And uh, so I, I will, here I, I, will, I will draw some, some little pictures or a little bit to give you some flavor of, of, the, of the single chapters. So it's not very precise. It's just to stimulate your imagination and then Maybe you can, you, you can think about yourself what, what this should be, but it should be clear when we pass to the, to the chapter. So when we can let act a group on a space, and then we can let act a group on a quantum space. So this is somehow the, the step I will explain in this, in this first chapter. What, what is uh, a quantum group? What is a quantum space? And so on. So what, what do I mean by this? In the second chapter, I will tell you a bit about the Haar state and other basics. In quantum groups, so this is something like when you have a group, you have some, some Haar state. And this allows you uh, to do integration against this Haar state over the group. And we can generalize this to quantum groups, and we will get a hard state. So this is a measure. And then when you form the integral, then you have a state. And then you can see what the features of the state are, and then you generalize it to some hard state. Then we have some representation theory and Tanaka Krein. So this is something like that a, a quantum group is uh, determined by its intertwiner spaces. So this is an intertwiner where T is a linear map. So this is something which I will explain in this, in this chapter 3. What, 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 I, what do I mean by, by such intertwiners and how do they determine the quantum group? And this will enable us to pass to the easy quantum groups. So definition of easy quantum groups. And an overview. So then I will define the easy quantum groups and give a small overview what, what these objects are. And this is. This is, folk, uh, this is based on this uh, Tanaka Krein because when you have some partition, so a uh, set theoretical partition which looks like this, so as I said, you, you don't have to care about the precise meaning of what I'm writing down, just to give you a flavor. So when, whenever we have some set theoretical partition, we 
can associate some linear maps TP and then this will give us some intertwiners and this will give us some quantum groups. So this is the story of easy quantum groups and then we will classify them and the map of easy quantum groups roughly looks like this. Okay, just to show you some map. <laughs> and then we will pass to, to something, uh, to, to some applications of the story. So of course I can, I can define some abstract objects. I can do it because I'm a mathematician and I like abstract objects. I don't care about, uh, what, uh, about the use of it. But I do care a little bit, and this is why I, I, will, I will give some applications. So we, we no, won't only define it, but we will say that they are really useful in some theories. And one of these theories is... Uh, um, right? Yes? That picture there with the reminiscence of Leonardo, what is that supposed to mean? This one? Yeah. Um, it's it's the, the map of uh, easy quantum groups. So <coughs> th there are some easy quantum groups here, some here, and there are some here, some here. It's just... Uh, when, when, you, when you try to, to uh, show which, which of the easy quantum groups are related to each other, then, then it has more or less this shape. So it, it's, at this point, it's almost meaningless to, to write it down in this introduction. I, I, I just wanted to give you some, some imagination that, that I, in the end, I, I will be able to draw some, some map, some, some land, the landscape or whatever of easy quantum groups. So our first application will be to free probability. And here to the Definetti. So free probability theory is a kind of a non-commutative probability theory that was uh, invented by Wojciechowski and then also by, uh, by Roland Speicher. So I'm working with Roland Speicher in Saarland University. So this is. Uh, I have to give this chapter because, because of my boss. <laughs> but uh, so, so this is also one of the sources where these easy quantum groups came from. So because uh, Speicher works on free probability and he was one of the uh, inventors of these easy quantum groups, he was mo mainly interested in these applications. So I will, I will speak a little bit about this. And what does it mean? Well, you have some, you have some permutation group acting on some vector and this will give you independence of this of the sequence so this is the classical definetti and then we will do the same with some quantum object and this will give us free independence so in this free probability context so at this, at, again, at this stage, you don't have to understand what, what, I'm, what I'm telling you here because probably you, you don't know what free probability is. But I will, uh, when we come to this chapter, I will tell you that there's classical probability. And when you take classical random variables and they are invariant under some action of the permutation group, you will get independence. And there's a non-commutative concept of free independence. And this is obtained when you let act a quantum group on this, uh, on some random variables. OK, so we will come to this. Uh, later. Another application. So this is an application which points out of the theory of uh, quantum groups. So quantum groups are really used for something. Now the second application is within the theory of quantum groups. So we have properties of quantum groups by combinatorial means. So mainly I will tell you something about certain decompositions of certain uh, of certain representations. So I will I will have some representation of a quantum group, and I will decompose it into other uh, representations, and they will be labeled again by these objects which we know from chapter four. 
And then I will tell you also a little bit about von Neumann algebraic aspects. Von Neumann algebraic aspects. And this is something like when you take a quantum group with this hard state, you can do some GNS construction. You will get some von Neumann algebra. And the question is, how is this related to the free group factors? And there are some, some links, and, and I will speak a little bit about this. So this might be interesting for those that work with von Neumann algebras, which I expect there are some here, <laughs> some experts here. OK, and maybe in the end, I can tell a little bit about the future, open problems, and so on. So, uh, I don't know. Does this look like a crystal ball? I don't know. So, crystal ball. So, whatever the future is. We, we, we're, I'm not very good in painting. <laughs> OK, so, so this is roughly the, the outline. And I, I expect that this will be more or less the first week. This will be the second week. And this one will be the third week. I don't know if it, if it, if it fits exactly with my schedule, but this is more or less the idea. OK, so this is just uh, to get it started. but. Is, is there is there any questions so so far for the moment? Okay, so maybe let's let's just start really with the with the lecture, namely with chapter one, introduction, and motivation. Okay, and we just start with an with a warm up example. Namely, so what, what, are, what are groups? So uh, I mean, some people study groups because they, they like the groups as such. Others like it to because they want to use it for something. So people that want to use it for something, maybe they, they want to let, let it act on some space. So this means that these groups tell you something about symmetries that are in the space. So what, what do I mean by such uh, symmetries? So and I will I will tell you three examples of groups seeing them as uh, symmetries. So for instance we can consider the finite set xn uh, of n points. OK, and now we can ask, what, what, is, what is the automorphism group of this set? So this is all bijective maps from xn to itself. And what is it? Well, I have n points, and I have to, bi to, have to bijack them onto themselves. So this is just permutation, right? So this is the permutation group. So here we, we, have the, we have a space. We can let our act our permutation group on it. And then this is the automorphism group of this space. So things like this are interesting for topologists. They, they take some, some topological spaces, and then they consider the fundamental group and so on. And then they maybe they distinguish objects by, by this fundamental <coughs> group. So this is a very basic example of, of some, some space and its automorphism group. We can maybe take a look at a slightly more complicated example. Namely, we consider the, th the sphere. So by, by the way, am I, am I speaking loud enough, or should I speak up? Is OK? OK. So the, the sphere 
is uh, all vectors x. Let's sum up to 1. So this is the sphere in the n-dimensional uh, real vector space. And uh, its isometry group has isometry group uh, iso of Sn minus 1. And this is just all maps, all linear maps, such that the inner product is preserved. So this, this comes from theory of uh, manifolds and so on. So here you have a manifold, and then you, then you ask, what, what are its uh, isometries? So those maps that preserve the inner product. And this is, of course, ON. So this is the orthogonal group. So this is another uh, place where where some the isometries you mean the Riemannian isometry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So so this is another place where you have some some space, and then you associate a group to it, and this shall tell you uh, which are the symmetries of this space. Okay, and maybe now a bit more complicated example namely the cube. So this may be seen as a graph. May be seen as a graph having uh, eight vertices and I hope it's 12 edges. And uh, of course, they, they are, there are some, some rules how they are connected. So maybe if you label uh, these two, V1 and V2, then there is an edge in between them. And uh, now an, its automorphism group is a bijection of the vertices unto itself, such that whenever vertices are connected, they are also connected in the image. Right? OK. its automorphism group uh, consists of bijections <coughs> maybe alpha from cube to the cube uh, yeah such that alpha vi and alpha vj are connected if and only if vi and vj are connected by an edge, of course. OK, so, so this is the automorphism group of, uh, of the cube. And uh, so what is its automorphism group? So the automorphism group is Z2, uh, three copies of it, and then the um, semi-direct product with the permutation group S3. So this may be written as this. So it's a wrath product of Z2 with S3. So I don't know if you've, if you've heard of this, but I will Maybe we, we, can, uh, we can study this a bit in the, in the example of n equals 2, so more general. So 
so more general, this is this breath product for the for the hypercube. So in in other dimensions. So maybe let me uh, let me do the example of n equals two. I mean, you can think a little bit about yourself. Uh, what what are the the automorphisms of such a cube, right? So so there are some uh, some symmetries which immediately come into mind, and this is uh, of course you you can you can flip it like this, you can flip it like that, and these flips are modeled by this Z two Z two action, and then you can uh, you can permute some some of the uh, well, so some of the perspective or some of the coordinates, and this is modeled by this S3. So this should give you an idea why, why this is true. Of course, if you want to write it down, it's a bit more complicated, but let us check it for n equals 2. So, so this is our cube, just a square. And the automorphisms so what can we do so we we can leave all these these points just as they are okay so this will be somehow our neutral element then we can then we can uh, exchange these two two points then, of course, we also have to exchange the points on the top. So I, I hope you understand what I mean by this picture. So, so this is just the flip in, in one direction. Maybe let's call this alpha. We can do it in the other direction. This will be our beta. And then we can also flip these two points, so the diagonal, and uh, leave the others invariant. So this will be our element sigma. And now we can also do some combination of these things. So of course, we can also uh, flip these two points. But this is exactly just the product alpha, beta, sigma. So maybe, maybe let, let me follow. Let, let, let me consider this point here. So first, with sigma, I, I map it to here. Then with beta, I map it to above. And then with alpha, I map it back. So I didn't move it. And so for the, for the next point, with sigma doesn't move it, beta maps it down, and alpha maps it over here. So you can just check it that this is alpha, beta, sigma. I have this symmetry, alpha, beta. I can also rotate. So this will be alpha, sigma. So this is not, not so obvious, but if, if you just uh, again, ma maybe let's let's take this point here. So sigma maps it here, and alpha maps it here, and yeah, so on. So with the other points, you you can you can immediately see that this is true. Of course, if if you apply this twice, then you just uh, get this one, I guess. You map this here and then over here. So this means the first one goes over here, and the second one goes over here. So this is applying this twice is this one. And we can also rotate into the other direction. So this is beta, sigma. And you can convince yourself that these are all symmetries of the square. OK, and now this strange group over there, so what? what how is this defined? Well, it's the group generated by three elements. Let me call them just for fun, alpha, beta, sigma. And so alpha and beta are the generators of these copies of Z2. So this means they fulfill the, gener the relation that if you square them, you get the neutral element. And now sigma is the generator of S2. OK, so this is a bit odd here, but this means that uh, 
again, if so, so at, at this at this stage, we cannot distinguish between Z2 and permutation group with two generators, of course. So alpha and beta, they also commute because here I have a I have a direct product. And now, so so now now I de described uh, the direct sum of Z2 with itself, and I described uh, S2. So now I have to describe the action of S2 on this group, which means that sigma gives gives rise to an automorphism. If I apply sigma from one side and the inverse of sigma from the other side, which is the inverse of sigma is just sigma itself, and it should map alpha to beta. And beta to alpha, so so this is this is this this uh, in, in general this this action of of this S three. You just take all the copies of of uh, Z two and you can permute these copies. And now if if you if you check these relations here, they are exactly ful fulfilled for for all these these maps over here, plus that this group over here has exactly these elements. So now this group has elements E, alpha, beta, sigma. Then, of course, if I can take alpha, beta, alpha, sigma, beta, sigma. I can take the product of all of these. But that's it. So if, if I now uh, multiply these, these objects with, with uh, alpha, beta, sigma, then I will always get some of these. So this means that these, these groups, this automorphism group here and this group here, they are in bijection. Okay. So this means that this group really describes the automorphism group of the square. And I hope that uh, you believe that if you take some hypercube in n dimensions, then this will be the, the automorphism group. OK. So is, yeah? That, that is just to take n copies of the group. And yes. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it, it just, just permutes the, the generators of this uh, Z2. Yeah, so, so this is called the rest product. So I, I don't know if, if there are some group theorists here, but I, I never heard of the breadth product before. I don't know how, how common this is in group theory. So I, I just learned about this in, in the context of quantum groups, because later on we will, we will also define a breadth product for quantum groups. But uh, apparently, this is a just a classical construction. Okay. And just as a, as a side remark, uh, note that the graph which looks like this, uh, has the same symmetry group. So this is just the, the graph that connects these two points, then these two points, and so on. And what, is the, what are the, the symmetries arising here? Well, of course, in, in each of these cases, I can, I can flip these two points, which gives me Z2. And then I can permute all these, all these uh, pairs, which gives me the action of Sn. So I, I get exactly the, the same symmetry group. It's another graph, but it gives the same symmetry group. <coughs> and uh, later, so, so maybe on, on Wednesday, we will come to, the, to some, some quantum graphs or some quantum symmetry groups. And then we will see that the quantum symmetry groups of these two things, they do not coincide. So this, this, sometimes this happens, the, the non-commutative world is, is a bit richer, so sometimes it happens that you have some classical objects, they have the same symmetry group, then you pass to some quantum objects, and then you have different symmetry groups. OK, but we will see this later. Is it the only connected graph with the same symmetry Sorry? Is square the only connected graph on four vertices which has the same symmetry group as this? Um, you say that this graph has the same symmetry yes. group as this. Yes. But this is not connected. 
Yeah, that's true. Probably, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not so familiar with this uh, with the automorphism groups of, of graphs, but it might be. Uh, yeah. Okay. So so this is just some some warm up to to uh, yeah get you in touch with with the concept of, of symmetries. And now let's let's go non-commutative and let's see what would happen in some non-commutative setups. So, so I, I was told that everybody's familiar with C star algebras and von Neumann algebras. Nevertheless, I, I will just highlight a few facts that, that I will need in the sequel. So, so I want to study symmetries in a non-commutative or in, in an operator algebraic context. context. So of course this, this, is, this is somehow an ad hoc uh, motivation. So no, you, you, can, you can't convince anybody that quantum groups should be studied just by stating this, this sentence. But once you're operator algebras, you might find it appealing that you say, OK, what, what's the symmetries in these contexts? So I, I will give you other motivations later. But for now on, we believe that we are all operator algebras and that we, uh, that we believe that such a, such a sentence makes sense and is, has, is interesting. So what is, what is somehow uh, one of the main philosophies in operator algebras? It's the <coughs> concept of non-commutative function algebras. So So the philosophy in C star over Neumann algebras, you take a topological compact space. And instead of this space, you do something which we want to call dualization. Namely, you, you study the algebra of continuous functions instead. So you have a compact space. And uh, instead of studying this topological space, you can pass to the function algebras and study this one instead. And this, this uh, works quite nice. You, 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 can, you can get some of the information about the topology of the space by studying this function algebra. And now, if we now allow that these functions f and g do not commute, we get, of course, C star algebras. And if you want, you can also s start with a measurable space. Then you, then you take the measurable bounded functions. And then you will get the von Neumann algebras. So this is an L. <laughs> OK, so, so this is probably uh, all known to you. And uh, probably I, I do not need to, uh, to recall the definition of C-star algebras. You can see them as norm-bounded subalgebras of uh, bounded operators. And for von Neumann algebras, they are closed in another norm, namely the weak or strong operator norm. And we have a nice fact, and that is if x is topological and compact, then c of x is a commutative c star algebra. And conversely, if you take a commutative C star algebra, then there is a topological space such that A is isomorphic to the functions over this space. So we have this duality, and we can even say what this x is. 
namely it's the spectrum of A, and this is given by all characters. So star homomorphisms which are non-zero. OK, so, so this is a, a well-known and nice fact, because this tells us that we really have a duality there. So hence we have something that C star algebras are non commutative topology. Okay, so if you do topology, instead of doing topology, you can study these function algebras <coughs> which are commutative C star algebras. And now if you're studying non-commutative C star algebras, you're doing non-commutative topology. Okay, so this is one, one philosophy, how you could motivate studying C star algebras. Of course, this is not the main historical motivation, but for the moment, let's, let's see it like that. So this means that uh, C star algebras may be seen as function algebras as non commutative function algebras over some quantum spaces. Okay, so this is a bit abstract, but uh, probably this is not very new for you. So uh, when I, when I take a non-commutative C star algebra, I can view it as a non-commutative function algebra over some non-commutative space or some quantum space. So, so sometimes it, it helps for my imagination that when I, when I study a C star algebra that I see it as a function algebra over some non-commutative non commutative space or some quantum space. And then I can ask my, myself some topological questions about this quantum space and I can answer it in terms of the C star algebra. So probably this, probably you, you've you've seen such a philosophy before, right? So maybe if you want to read a bit more about this, then so maybe step by step, I will I will also introduce some some literature. So my literature number thirteen. So sorry, this, so so I, I just started to to write down my my literature, and I realized that maybe it's not the order of appearance. <laughs> And it's also not an alphabetic order, so it's uh, basically no order. So this is Garcia, Bondia, Garibi, Figue, Roa. And the book is Elements of Non Commutative Geometry. Probably you know this book. And here in chapter one, you will see exactly this philosophy uh, of non commutative topology. Okay, and in the same spirit, likewise, we can see the Neumann algebras as non commutative measure theory. Okay, so uh, this is uh, somehow my, my, my background, how I, how I want to motivate C star algebras, viewing them as, as quantum spaces. And if you uh, recall my introduction, there I said something, we have groups acting on spaces. Now we have something like quantum spaces, so we can, act, we, we, we can ask the question, what are the right symmetries for this? So this will be our path to quantum groups. But uh, before doing so, we will mainly use the language of universal C star algebras. I don't know if everybody is familiar with universal C star algebras, so I, maybe I, I just very briefly uh, sketch it. So, 
C star algebras may be defined concretely uh, so as a norm closed star subalgebra of B of H or abstractly So Banach algebra and then our norm condition. And these two de definitions they coincide. And this is mainly the GNS construction. that allows us to uh, associate to an abstract C star algebra a concrete one. And if you take the direct sum over all of this, you get a, a faithful representation, and then you can view it as a norm closed star subalgebra. OK, so we have these, we have these two approaches to, to C star algebras, either the concrete or the, the abstract one. And the abstract one helps us to define universal C star algebras. Yeah? Uh, can I just digress for a moment about that? Yeah. So he asked a question if that's a unique connected thing. Uh -huh. But if you have a square and four dots, uh -huh. uh, just uh, uh, like this, right? and join them to each of those uh, vertices, then the symmetry group should be the same as this one. Because you have these vertices at degree 3 and mm -hmm. just degree 1. So if you have symmetry of the square, it's forced. Like the symmetry of those outside points is kind of forced. So those, those don't contribute to any mm -hmm. symmetry. So it's not unique. OK, yeah, probably you're right, yeah. Well, yeah. Probably you, you checked it uh, quietly that, that, that these are no, all the same. I just think <laughs> like all these four vertices should go to each other. Yeah, yeah. Once you fix that, the other four are kind of fixed. Yeah, so, so, so the, these two are, are seen as, as one yeah. point in some sense, yeah. Yeah, probably you're right, yeah. So what, what, what was your name again? So maybe I, I call this Somia. I call yes. this your example. Like this? So this is your example. <laughs> this is your graph for the moment. <laughs> OK. So uh, for the universal C-star algebras, uh, how, how do we def define universal C-star algebras? So do, do you mind if I erase your example now? <laughs> Just a brief reminder of universal C star algebra. So, what are the ingredients? Well, first you take a set of generators. Generators. And then you form the uh, star algebra out of it. So so this will be the non-commutative polynomials in the xi and the xi star. And then we take a set of relations. Which is just a, s a subset of, of this uh, of this poly polynomial, so just some polynomials, but we will call them relations. Uh, then we form the ideal the ideal generated by these relations, and then we put <coughs> a e of a e and r as the all these polynomials and we divide out the ideal of these relations. So this means 
every polynomial that I have here will be zero in, in, this, in this algebra. So this is why I call it a relation. So this is a universal star algebra. But we want to have a C star algebra. So what do we need? We need a C star norm. So we put x, the norm of x, as the supremum of, of all px, where p is a C star seminorm on this object. Um, and by C star seminorm, I, well, I mean that P is a seminorm. And then, of course, submultiplicative and our C star condition. Uh, so I take the supremum of all of these, and if this is always finite, then I put C star of, of the set of generators E with relations R as this universal star algebra. I mod out the null space. because this might just be a semi-norm, semi so I, some, sometimes the norm of it might be zero, so I, and the element might not be zero, so I mod this out, and then, uh, then I take the completion. Okay, pro this is familiar to you, I, probably, I guess. So, so this is a very abstract way of, of uh, defining C star algebras. And of course, this can, be, this can be really nonsense, because it can be that either here with this construction, this, this semi-norm might be infinite, or it might be that everything collapses to, to zero. So that, you, you, that your relations are so, so strong that they cannot be fulfilled, and then it's just zero. OK, but this is a universal C-star algebra. And more important than the construction is the universal property. So if you want, you can forget about the construction. Just uh, see, just, just uh, memorize that it works. And then now we have the universal property, and this is the following. So if V is a C star algebra such that set of yi uh, fulfills or satisfies the relations r, then then there is a star homomorphism phi from ER to B mapping XI to YI. Okay, so this is the universal property and this is, this is why uh, universal C-star algebras are interesting because you can really study some relations as such. So whenever you, you, you have some, some other relations that follow from, from these relations and you find this out in your universal C-star algebra, you know that this is always fulfilled in other C-star algebras and so on. Sometimes uh, you, you can you can see that this universal sister algebra is simple. So this means that this is always uh, an isomorphism. Uh, well, at least on the image of the yi. And then you have a nice description for some sister algebras. So I in general, the, the nice thing is that you that you have a lot of star homomorphisms for free. And also, it's a very easy way to define sister algebras because I don't care about any realization. I just write down my generators and my relations. And if this is nice, then I can study it. OK. Yeah. OK, so in, in case somebody sees it for the first time, if you take the sister algebra 
generated by a u and a 1 such that u is unitary. This is a commutative C star algebra. And it's isomorphic to the functions over this sphere. Yes. Yeah. And if that norm is finally stored, then uh, yeah. nothing more is needed. Yes, yeah. So if so 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 this is this is my, my condition that when I have this uh, generators and the relations that this norm must always be finite. And if this is true, then I define this object and I call it the universal C star algebra. Otherwise I, I do not uh, write down this object. So for instance, this, this object uh, I could not write it down. So this does not exist. Because the norm of x can be infinite. Oh, well, not infinite, but... x squared minus yx equal to 1. Yeah, yeah, I understand. There is a, another example which is C star of xy. Yeah. Where xy equals xy minus yx is 1. X, xy minus yx is 1. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. You can't even find a C star now. Uh huh. Ah, oh, you can find a C star. You cannot find a C star. Yeah, yeah. Except it's not visible. Yeah, yeah. So, do, do you also want to have a name for this? No. Or? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so these are. Is this different from taking all possible representations in Hilbert space and then taking the soup or all the norms? Yeah, it's it's the same construction because he, here in, in this in this soup, so in principle, if you want, you can you can take. Uh, star represent representations of this on a Hilbert space. This gives you a semi norm, and the supremum over all this is exactly what, what you said. So yeah, it's the same. Are there other ways of getting some C star semi norms? If you're saying it's the yeah. same. Um, no, he write it this way because this way you can see that uh, that is a set. You write it as write it as supreme over all representations. Representations in different Hilbert spaces, right? So that may not form a set, I don't know, but this, mm. this you can see. Set of all semi norms. That forms a set. That's what he, that's why he writes that. Yeah, so so pro probably it's 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 uh, I I don't know another way of, of defining a C star semi norm but yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I'm also writing it this way ju just to, to avoid uh, the Hilbert space terminology at this point, but probably it's, uh, there's no other way. I don't know. Okay, so, so these are my universal C star algebras that I, that I want to uh, use. So now, now I, I, I come back to this philosophy over here. So C star algebras, seeing them as some non-commutative topology, and as I said, uh, this way we, we can give meaning to some quantum spaces, and now we want to let act some objects which are supposed to be our groups in this quantum world. And this should be our quantum groups. So how, how do I do this? Okay, let, let, me, let me first do the classical case, so we take a space and we let a group act on it. So, uh, what are symmetries of quantum spaces? Okay, first again the classical case, so let x be topological and compact. And let g 
be a compact group acting on x. So now we apply our machinery. Uh, this is the group law. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I could just have written down G, but uh, in, in, a s in a second I, I will focus on this group law. Okay. So so I, I just take a group which acts on X, and now applying our machinery for this for this X, uh, instead of studying the topological space, we study the functions over it, over it, and then we turn it non-commutative, and we get a C-star algebra. So we can also add let act not g on x, but c of g, so the functions over g, it's a compact group, the functions over g on the functions over x. And now, if we turn the functions over x into something non-commutative, we should also turn the functions over g into something non-commutative. OK, so how do we do this? Well, the functions over g, that's just a c star algebra, so we just take a c star algebra. That's easy. But a group is more than a, than a set. It's, comes, it's, a, it's a set together with a group law. So this should also be modeled in our dualized picture. So how, how do we model this, this group law? So maybe what, what, what did I say? So applying the machinery uh, of 1.2, we may let act CG on C of X and then turn both non-commutative. But since uh, G is more than a set or a topological space, it's more than a topological space maybe, we should also dualize the group law. OK, so, so what's it? So let, let us take a closer look to the, uh, on, on the group law. So what's the group law? It's a map from G cross G to G, and it maps a pair to a product. So now it's a multiplicative group for me. So what, what is it? Uh, what is the dualized picture? So we have, a, we have CG and then we have a map to CG cross G and of course if we have F we can okay so that's, that's stupid so I would like to write down F composed with the group law so this would be uh, two times the same symbol. So, so maybe let's, let's say, so it's, it's, the, it's mapped to the, to the map that maps ST to F of ST. OK, so this is a standard thing we, we, we can always do. Map from one space to another. On the level of functions over the space, it turns around. So, uh, but now we, we can, we observe that this is isomorphic to the tensor product of these two algebras. So what do I have here? I have a map now from algebra to algebra tensor algebra. So this is something we can also describe in a non-commutative language. So uh, we conclude that a quantum group should come with some map from A to A tensor A. And this is exactly what Voronovich defined in 87 and then gave another definition in 95. I will now write down the definition of 95.
also later, so probably tomorrow I will also tell you a bit about the historics of quantum groups. So I, I decided not to, to do the historical approach and then give the definition, but more intuitive, uh, intuitive approach and then at the end give you something about the history. But uh, let me just say that Voronovich is uh, one of the, the fathers of quantum groups in the C-star algebraic setting. He gave this definition. So these are my references, four and five. Uh, so this is called compact matrix pseudo groups. The name quantum groups was just later. And also, then he gave another definition in 1998, which was in fact 1995, but uh, it appeared 1998. So this is his definition. A quantum group, compact quantum group, is a C star algebra A, a unital, a unital C star algebra A. <laughs> uh, together with a unital star homomorphism delta from A to A tensor A. So I take the minimal tensor product such that the span, OK, so first co-associativity. Associativity. So this is the first thing, and furthermore, we want to have that the span of delta A one tensor B in A tensor A is dense, and also if we turn it round. So we, we write we write shorthand that these two two sets should be linearly dense. One tensor B. And below that the, the other one is B tensor 1, yeah. 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 So may, maybe it's, it's more intuitive to, to write it like this. Delta of A uh, of 1 tensor A should be dense and also A tensor 1, so change the positions. And this should be linearly dense, so I can take uh, linear spans of these elements here. So this is shorthand. OK, so this is the definition. And we also write uh, A of CG and speak of, uh, of G as the quantum group. So uh, again, in this philosophy that I just explained before that this is seen as some non-commutative function algebra over some non-commutative object, and this is our quantum group. OK. Is there a question about this definition so far? 
so far we, we understand that from, from this motivation over there that a quantum group should be a C star algebra together with such a map delta. But w what, is, what is this? Well, this is co-associativity. I will tell you a little bit about this. And what is the second condition? Well, I will also tell you about this condition. But for, for the moment, it should be just clear that this is our functions over the group, and this is our group law, the delta. It's also called uh, the co-multiplication. So when speaking of uh, quantum groups, I realized that the first remark is always important to say, this is not a group. It's a quantum group, OK? So a quantum group is not a group. So this, this is really something different here. So it's, so since, since it comes from this spirit as, as dualizing the object and then turning the algebra non-commutative, we, we call it a quantum group, but it's not a group. So it's, it's really something more general. So some people don't like the, the wording quantum group, and they call it quantum algebras. So uh, OK, this is up to you what, what you use. So it, it seems to me that, that in the community of compact quantum groups, the term quantum group is perfectly uh, accepted. So I, I, will, I will use it. But you should, you should always note that this is not a group. OK, second. Uh, If G is a compact group, then CG, so the functions, is a unital star algebra. Uh, yeah? What is G? This one? Uh, we also write A equals to C. Where from G is coming? So th this is just a notation. So so this is a so, so a quantum group is is a C star algebra A together with this delta. So this tuple. But instead of of speaking of this as the quantum group, we can also view it as some some functions over over some G, and then call G the quantum group. But this this, this should be read in in quotation marks. So this is. This is just 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 notation. Delta tensor. This ah, this this one. Uh, so this delta this this maps from A to A tensor A. So now we're in here, and now I apply delta on the first component, I get A tensor A, and identity on the second one. So this is identity of A. So, uh, why the minimal one? Why or, or what it is? What, what, it is. what, what it is. So it's a, it's a spatial tensor product. So you, you take the algebraic tensor product of A and, and with itself, and then you re represent it on a, on a Hilbert space faithfully, and then you take the completion in this Hilbert space. There's also a maximal way, which, which is a little bit like this universal C-star algebra that I, that I wrote before. You take the supremum over all representations of the algebraic tensor product. And this gives some, some maximal tensor product. And in general, they are not the same, the minimal and the maximal one. But th this, is a, this is a whole, <coughs> there's a whole uh, business of, of people that, that, that try to distinguish the maximal and the minimal one. And when is it the same and so on. So yeah. So maybe, maybe if of course, what one could discuss why I take the minimal here, not the maximal. But maybe, maybe let's postpone this a bit and just, just say that we take the tensor product. And for those that are experts in tensor product, I take the minimal one. Yeah, and for, for, the, for the notation, so uh, do, do you know the, the irrational rotation algebra? Do you know this one? OK, so then this won't help if I, if I give you a remark about this. But for, for, for those that that know it, there's a definition of a universal C-star algebra generated by two unitaries uh, with this relation. And so U and V are unitaries. 
and you have uv equals e to the 2 pi theta of vu. And if, if theta, theta equals 0, then this is the function over the two torus. And now if theta is, is not uh, 0, this will give you some theta deformed two torus, just by considering the C-star algebra. But again, this is just a virtual object. OK, so, so this is only for, for those that, that have, have heard of the non-commutative torus. This is the definition of the non-commutative torus. And also there, the, d the object is just defined via its function algebra, so via the C-star algebra. And this is this, the same spirit here. So I, I know that this is a bit confusing, so maybe just forget about it. So the, the precise definition is this one. OK, but if you're interested, we, 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 can, we can discuss privately maybe about the, the torus and then why, why we, you can view it as, a, as some virtual object. OK, now my second remark is if G is a compact group, then C of G is a unital C star algebra. And this map delta that I defined over there is co-associative. So mayb maybe let's just check it since this is one line. So I take my, my delta tensor identity composed with delta, and I apply it to a function, to, to a function in C of G. So, so now my, my delta is uh, this map over here. This is the CG to, to this tensor product. So I apply it to a function f. Then uh, I'm in CG tensor CG. And then on the first leg, I apply delta again. So I, I have three components. Right, so I have here S T U. So that's okay, right? So from, from C G I pass to C G tensor C G and then again I have another copy of C G. So I have three copies. So it, it looks like that. And this is the same as having delta of F of S T comma U. So you should check this for So assume that delta of f would be of the form f1 tensor f2. Then this identity would leave f2 invariant. And we have delta of f1, which means that f1 is applied to the product of s and t. Okay, so, so here I would have f1 tensor f2 applied to, 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 this, to this element. And now if you check it for this one, then linear combination, completion, and so on, so you see that this equation uh, is true for all f. So. And linear combination and so on. So we have this. And now, how is our delta f uh, defined? Well, it applies f to, to st. So st times u. OK, so, so this is just the application. Now I know that my group law is associative. So this means I can also write it like this, f of s and then times tu. And this is, if I do this the same construction, I see that this is exactly this, this one. So you, you see that this uh, is really nothing else but uh, associativity in the, in the classical case, OK? So since we dualized it, now we have this co-associativity. OK, but what's, what's this? Uh, what's so, so, so this explains 
why we want to have a unital C star algebra, why we want to have this delta, why we want to have this co-associativity. But wh what is now this density condition? So what's that? So the density condition tells us that we do not only have a st the structure of a semi-group, but in fact of a group. density condition. So we have two facts which I will quote without proof. So if G is a compact semi group uh, with cancellation that is ST equals SU implies t equals u, then g is a group. So a semi-group with cancellation is a group. And another fact, if g is a compact semi-group, or and if now this delta of CG and the other set if they are linearly dense then G has cancellation. This is not too complicated to check, but I don't want to do it here. But what, what, you, what you should see is uh, this condition over here, that this span is dense, which is a bit strange when you see it for the first time. This just tells me if I start with a compact semi-group, I take the functions over it, and then I have this condition, then in fact my G has cancellation, and then in fact it is a group. So somehow, this models exactly the step from semi-group to group. Hence, the density condition characterizes uh, the step from semi-group to group. Maybe I put it in quotation marks, so if I'm really in the classical case, this is exactly what I'm, what I'm writing down. And in the quantum, quantum philosophy, it, it's from quantum semi-group to quantum group. OK, is there, is there a question about that? So now, let me check the time, 15 minutes. So every compact, every compact group is a compact quantum group. So we only check. simply check the density condition which I again don't want to do here so uh, this means that compact quantum groups really generalize uh, the theory of compact groups in the spirit of this dualization right that passing from the object to the functions over it uh, and conversely Conversely, if A delta is a compact quantum group, C 
such that A is commutative. What happens then? Well, by Gelfand Neimark, we just know that A is a function over a space, over a compact space. So then A is isomorphic to the function over some G, where G uh, is the spectrum of A. And and this map delta, this yields. <coughs> so now I'm using again the isomorphism of CG tensor G with CG cross G. So this map yields. Yields a map M from G, G to G just by uh, you take spectrum of A tensor A and you map it to spectrum of A by mapping a character to phi applied to the co multiplication. So what, what, what am I saying? I have this compact quantum group. A is commutative. So I know it's isomorphic to the functions over a space. So now, well, if I just consider spectrum of A tensor A to spectrum of A, I immediately get such a map. OK, that's nice. So now the spectrum of A tensor A is, of course, exactly the spectrum of this C star algebra, so the spectrum of this C star algebra. So it's G cross G. So th this one is, is really this G cross G. And the spectrum of A is, is just my, my G. So from the co-multiplication, I immediately get a map from G cross G to G. And this is, of course, my group law. Hence, G is a compact group. OK, so we see that uh, we conclude that compact quantum groups really generalize compact groups, right? So starting with a compact group, I, I can view it as a compact quantum group. And starting with a compact quantum group, such that the C-star algebra is commutative, I get a compact group. OK, so, so this is really the theory that the theory fits nicely together with uh, the spirit that I, that I had before, yeah? Mm -hmm. So group law and co-associativity will imply associativity, yeah? Yes, yeah. It, it's really all as one to one. And so group law and this gives <coughs> current delta comes from this group law. Yeah, so, so, so this, yeah. this delta gives me the group law, and the associativity of the group law comes from the co-associativity of the delta. Yeah. It's the one that comes from this group law. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If if you go back yeah, the, the way then then if you go back then you get back the delta, yeah. Okay, so uh maybe if you want to read a little bit more about this, I should give some, some references. Um So for this, for this B, this is my reference one, which I did not define yet, but I will tell you in a second. And for this other thing, I would recommend reference three. So hmm? I, I, I will also tell you about what, what is three. <laughs> So I, I just wanted to say that uh, 
I only have 10 minutes and it, it's maybe it, it's a bit disappointing for you that, that I didn't show you a, 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 an example of an honest quantum group now. So all I did was the motivation, uh, so, so what is the quantum group? So next time I will, I will tell you about some, uh, some examples of, of uh, compact quantum groups. So some arising from classical groups like, like this, starting with a compact group, we can view it as a compact quantum group. But I, I will also write down a real example of a, an honest compact quantum group. But uh, maybe for those that, that, that want to have some, some private reading, I, I will just write down some, some reference that references that I would recommend for getting uh, in touch with compact quantum groups. Of course, you can read the original papers of Voronovich, but as usual, maybe it's, it's nicer to read this, some survey or some, some later articles. Uh, by the way, the numbers that you write down, yeah. you all have to have to the Yeah. You give me a copy of your notes. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So surveys on quantum groups. So an, a very good one is Maas van Dale. Notes on compact quantum groups. 1998. The second standard reference is Küstermanns to C. A survey of C star algebraic quantum groups. Then there's a book by Thomas Timmermann. An invitation to quantum groups is from 2008. Then there were these two references by Voronovich. And maybe another reference which I just added to the list today. So this is 3B. And this is a preprint by Neshveyev and Tusse. And this is just called compact quantum groups and their representation categories. And this is available on Neshveyev's homepage. So this is not, not published yet. So this is a a very recent compact quantum groups and some further stuff compact quantum groups and their representation categories but I, I guess if, if you just go to the web page of Neshveyev uh, then you will then you will get the preprint yeah. so may maybe maybe this is this is the, the latest one and this is also very very well written this one is a book so this is very detailed it has a lot of algebraic stuff and then passes to the C star algebraic stuff. So maybe this is, you, you, you should maybe jump to the, to chapter, to chapter five or something like this. If you don't want to spend so much time on, on reading algebraic stuff. And these are classical surveys which, which are also well established. Okay, I, I think that's it for today. So if you have any questions. You, you can also come to my office. I w which is which is my office number? I guess it's uh, three. It's uh, three ten. So you can also come and we can discuss a little bit if you want. Yeah. Oh, only the compact ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is a bit a tricky question. So, so a general definition of a quantum group, there is none. So the group theorists, they, they can tell you what is a group. But for the quantum groups, you, 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 can, you always have to say, in which setting are you thinking? So if you're thinking in algebraic setting, so if you don't like C-star algebras and Neumann algebras, just algebras, there's a definition. 
if you like C star algebras and if you want to have a set a one based on C star algebras, then this is the definition I, I gave for compact quantum groups. Then there's also one for locally compact quantum groups. There's one uh, using von Neumann algebras. So there are several things, but the the, the point is always that you, you pass from the group to some algebra over it, and the, the question is what th th this algebra, what, what, what should it be equipped with? For example, in both three, we have this kind of mm -hmm. so what kind of like ah. so, so in, in chapter one to four, it's algebraic ones, and from then on, it's C star algebraic and binomial algebraic ones. So it covers both. So the, the algebraic approach is top algebra. Yeah, so I, next time I, I will tell you a little bit about the, the rich world of, of quantum groups. So, so right now this was the motivation. Next time I will tell you more about the different approaches. But uh, in the end we will always focus to, uh, on this compact quantum group, so the C-star algebraic, operator algebraic world, so to be on the, on the, on the safe side, not leaving operator algebras. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.